Good morning. I'm Karen Brockman, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to worship this morning at Vancouver Heights United Methodist Church. We join you from the sanctuary. Uh, Pastor Joanne invited us to do the welcome, and we chose to be in the sanctuary because I can visualize everybody sitting in their places. I can see you, and it gives me comfort to be with you in the sanctuary. Now, Monty. We're do, we've been doing well, um, along with the rest of you, we've been learning new things. We've learned that going out to dinner means going to pick up dinner and bringing it home. We've learned that going to the grocery store means you put on a mask and you pretend you're a doctor while you um, <laughs> try to stay away from other people. Um, at this time, we'd like you to join us in our affirmation. I, I am, am a beloved, beloved child of God and, and a beauty, beauty to, to behold. behold. Today's scripture is from Psalms 116, chapters 1 and 2, and Monty's doing chapters 12 through 19. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. And now 12 through 19. What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, thy son, thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So ends the reading of the word.
Pastor Regina Morgan join us as a guest pastor to give the message. And we shared a couple of ways that you could help support the reopening of her business, the Naturally Beautiful Project, by purchasing some items from our Amazon wish list. The response was great. These are just a few items that our church has purchased, and there's more coming from Battleground United Methodist Church as well. I want to thank you for your support of Regina's business, and if you'd still like to contribute, We've posted a link to the Amazon wish list on our church website. This week on Friday the 19th, we celebrate Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day or Jubilee Day. It marks the end of slavery in our country. But as we know, freedom didn't necessarily mean freedom for all. The past few weeks have shown us that. So this week as we celebrate Juneteenth, and how far we've come as a country, let's also recognize how much work is still left to be done to address racism and social injustice in our country. On Wednesday night, we'll continue our online discussion groups on racism. If you're interested in joining us for that discussion, please email the church office for more information and a link to the Zoom invite. Thank you. Welcome back to another story time from the Complete Illustrated Children's Bible. Today's story is from Genesis 18, and it's called Abraham Entertains Angels. 
Not long after this, Abraham saw three strangers passing by. He hurried out to meet them and offered to bring water to wash their feet and food for them to eat while they rested in the shade of a nearby tree. Sarah baked some bread while Abraham bought his choicest meat for the men to eat and milk for them to drink. Then one of the men, who was really God, asked Abraham where his wife was. When Abraham replied that she was inside the tent, God told him that he would come back within a year and that Sarah would have given birth to a son. Sarah was listening from in the tent and could not help laughing out loud, for she was far too old to have children. But God asked, why is Sarah laughing? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Sure enough, nine months later, Sarah gave birth to a baby boy and named him Isaac, which means he laughs. This week, we learned about a man named Abraham. God made Abraham a promise earlier that he would be a father and that he would have too many descendants to count, as many as the stars in the night sky. But Abraham and his wife were really old and didn't think they could have children, but they trusted God. In this story, God keeps his promise, and Abraham and Sarah have a son and name him Isaac. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our second scripture reading today is Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In the sense of gospel reading. All right, the Lord be with you. Um, this is the education part of our church. This is a, a classroom that typically um, has Deb Avery as the teacher and our middle school students sitting around the table. Um, we use it for other classes as well, including our Stephen ministry program and sometimes our evening Bible studies. So we have, we have two scriptures this morning. We have the scripture from Genesis 18, um, one of my favorite parts of the Bible. And in Genesis 18, we have three men that appear to Abraham. He's known as Abram in, in this part of the scripture. And the amazing part is that Abram has just that most amazing part of hospitality. He sees these men, he jumps up, he offers um, to wash their feet, he offers to bring them food, he rallies Sarah to come out and to meet them. So important in the 18th chapter of Genesis because the second half of, of this is then the story of Sodom. And um, this, the challenge of Sodom is that there's not one person in the entire town that is found to be hospitable. And so while Abraham and Sarah um, give everything they have to the stranger, um, God blesses them. And while the others um, refuse to welcome the stranger, God turns God's back on them. So a really key part of the story just before we start. And then from the Matthew story, we have Jesus in the heart of ministry, Jesus as the good rabbi. Jesus as the one who sometimes teaches in the synagogues and sometimes teaches on the hillside and sometimes teaches with the Pharisees and Sadducees and sometimes just anyone who will listen and often the common person will come and sit next to Jesus, and he will share a story in a way that makes good sense to them based on um, their experiences. And so I want to combine those, those images today. I want, to, I want to say if Jesus were here, if Jesus were working with, with us as, as a good teacher, as a good rabbi, what would Jesus be doing with the times we're living in? And what would Jesus be wanting to tell us in the scripture today that um, starts in Genesis 18, but then, then moves around that early part of Genesis and, and moves around a number of traditions, moves around the, the Jewish tradition, um, the Christian tradition, but also the Muslim tradition. And so I've got a bunch of stuff we're going to unpack today because I get to be in my teacher versus my preacher mode. Um, and so I want to start with a basic tenet of the United Methodist Church that I absolutely adore. And that is the sense that every sermon I preach or every um, class we hold must have a balance of grace and responsibility. So our worship service begins with the grace of I am a beloved child of God and a beauty to behold. And by the end of that service, I had better know that the grace that I received is not meant only for me, but is meant for my neighbor as well. And especially the neighbor that I have not yet met, or the neighbor that may be different from me. And so I have a responsibility to share that grace um, with all of God's people. 
Another part of the Methodist tradition is the quadrilateral. Um, it means that, yes, we do take our scripture seriously. It is the foundation for who we are. And yet we know that scripture says many things. And it, it is hard to interpret what was written in Genesis 18 um, to this group of people um, today in our current circumstances. And so the best way to do that is, um, we, we believe, is to combine scripture with an understanding of our tradition and what our tradition, how our tradition weighs out certain interpretations. But then we also use good reason. We also use our experience of the Holy Spirit, not just our daily experiences, um, but our experiences of how we've seen God work. And is this um, thing that I'm wanting to say today, is that similar to what God has said through the years? And so I'm going to um, help myself out with, with starting last week in Genesis, we have the proclamation that, that all of creation is good. And we need to trust that, um, not just in Genesis 1, 2, 3, but throughout um, the scriptures. We need to trust that um, alongside um, God's best intent to teach us this, is a human um, tendency to to want to do something, and it's called dualism. Um, it is um, that sense of wanting to be a tribe, wanting to gather others that are like us, and and wanting to go against others that are not like us. And sometimes that works out easier than others. So if we're playing sports, it's nice that we can have some some sense of competition. If we are um, a people with a distinct ethnic background, um, the us versus them can lead us to diminish them, can lead us to see them as less than human, can allow us to victimize them and use God's holy word to do that. And so there, there's always this challenge um, in faith um, to to hear the genuine voice of God and to hear that God truly speaks to all. Um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is, is one of my um, recent discoveries. I, I love that sense of having a rabbi um, teach you about something that you kind of know is not quite right. So in my studies, I, I've, I've come across Ishmael and Isaac, and I've, and I've gotten prickly around the sense that Isaac gets to be chosen, um, and Ishmael, not so much. And that we've had entire wars based on, um, we believe God has chosen Isaac, and in some ways, because God chose Isaac and Jesus comes after Isaac, um, that, that God chose us. And then with our very um, helpful way of, of translating things, well, of course, then we are the newer and the better. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says something about a counter-narrative. The, the trust that, yes, God does choose, but God doesn't reject. And wanting to give us the counter-narrative of, of looking across the book of Genesis and recognizing that both Ishmael and Isaac are blessed and that truly Ishmael is loved by God, certainly by his mother, but also by Isaac and Abraham, his father. To the point that we know that um, when I think this is Genesis 25 when we have um, Abraham, Abraham's burial and we have Isaac and Ishmael both at his graveside together um, saying goodbye to their father. And after this moment in time, after there is a goodbye to Abraham, we have God doing a formal blessing for Isaac. This is because Abraham never gave Isaac a blessing. And the rabbis have said perhaps that is because Abraham did not want to um, make Ishmael feel neglected or left out. 
For God early on blessed Ishmael. And God early on blessed Isaac. Before their births, God had given them a blessing. Part of the visit of the three angels, or the three men, who came to Abraham in Genesis 18 was the sense of Sarah in her old age will give birth to a child. And Sarah laughs, and we are meant to laugh along with her. Because God loves to do the impossible. God loves to overturn obstacles and show us that nothing will stand in God's way. This is a key part to why Isaac was so important um, in the story of Genesis. Isaac is consistently the weaker one. Ishmael comes out strong. He can do anything. Isaac, not so much. Isaac doesn't have very many speaking parts, if any. He, he finally blesses his sons, but after he has been tricked into doing so. Isaac is actually kind of a sad character. Um, Ishmael, not so much. Ishmael is a stronger character. But let's, um, let's take away a couple of the things we've already talked about so that it's a little easier to talk about what I'm going to do next. And, and Melba is out there scratching her head and saying, oh no, she's done that again. But yes, Melba, I have. Um, so God has said creation is good. And then we move on and we have um, interesting stories about um, two of Abram's um, sons. We have um, stories of God asking Abraham to sacrifice his sons. Now the sacrifice of Ishmael happens in Genesis 21. And this is basically when Sarah decides she can't have Hagar and Ishmael around her anymore. And she sends them out to the desert. Abraham tries to interfere and God says, no, I will take care of him. Abraham, you need to, to be um, following along with what Sarah wants at this point. And so Ishmael is sent out to the desert to die. And um, Hagar cries out to God, and God comes and rescues. A chapter later, God asks Abraham to um, sacrifice Isaac. This doesn't really make any good sense, but it is a consistent theme. Um, and so here is Isaac being put up on an altar to be sacrificed, and then God comes in with God's grace, apparently, and says, no, other gods might want you to do this, this terrible thing, but no, I, I won't make you to do this thing, and offers a ram for a sacrifice instead of Isaac. And isn't it interesting that in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we have a consistent story of God's own son, or God's own self, um, which is what Emmanuel means. Um, being sacrificed. Um, we call it atonement theory. Um, atonement theory can get us in trouble. But isn't it interesting that the, the key figures in all three faiths have that as a story, um, a story of connection for them. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Um, the Jews call this act of reason, they call it midrash. And it's a, it's a fun exercise for those, especially on the outside, who are able to benefit from, from thousands of years of, of rabbis sorting through um, both the scripture as they know it, and then their own schools of logic. And so what the counter narrative is that we, that we need to lift up today the counter-narrative to Isaac being the chosen one, Isaac being the one that is sacrificed, is the fact that Ishmael is also loved, and Ishmael is also chosen. Ishmael is just not the key story for what is happening in Genesis here. But Ishmael will be a key story later on. 
Um, a, a story later on as Ishmael and Isaac um, bless their father goodbye. And in some rabbinic tradition, as Hagar is then reunited with Abraham. And Abraham is um, given six more sons by a woman whose name means pleasing, doing an act that is pleasing to God. So that could be a third woman altogether, that could be Hagar. The Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity started um, with the three men who came to Abraham. The three people who came to give him good news. And because he chose to connect with these strangers, he chose to offer acts of hospitality, he was blessed by them. The three persons of God could also, um, in Christian tradition, include Isaac and Ishmael and Jesus and what each of these traditions might have to teach us. We know that Ishmael and Isaac are both part of our, the Hebrew scriptures, um, but also part of the, the Quran, just as Jesus is part of the Quran. People have asked me this week, um, as we continue our study of how faith might get in our way, how the things that we say and do and believe might help or hurt our neighbors. People have, have struggled over the sign that's in our front yard, and the sign says Black Lives Matter, and the sign lists three people whose lives have been lost. As I looked back on, on the message last week um, from Pastor Regina, um, I thought of those lives lost um, as our Holy Trinity to be lifted up this month. Just three of the many people who came to this world um, wanting to offer blessing. And three people who encountered violence along the way. Was there sacrifice needed? No, I don't think it was. Um, will those sacrifices help us to learn? Well, that will be up to us. We will continue to struggle with knowing that all of us do matter. And yet, where Jesus will be is with the ones who are struggling most. Jesus will um, be with us as we sit alongside our neighbors and as we work to make sense of this bigger story, this bigger narrative of which we are a part. Amen. Greetings, my name is Michael Niehaus. I am lay leader here at Vancouver Heights United Methodist Church. During a normal church service, if we, anybody remembers what normal looks like, you might see me back here. Uh, from in the back, back of the sanctuary is where I normally display uh, our song lyrics and other visual supplements for our church service. Also towards the end of our service, I display some headlines from the news that help us focus our prayers outside uh, of our doors. So today I am going to try uh, to recreate that for for us, and um, we will display some of uh, the headlines that are facing us today. Afterwards, I will invite you to remain in an attitude of prayer and pray with me.
Creator God, our friend and companion in the streets, in police stations, on curbsides, at takeout restaurants, in hospital waiting rooms, in public health offices. You, Lord, who wait for us to open the door, to admit our faults, and to forgive. Give us courage to do the hard acts, to love mightily, and give tenderly. Holy Spirit, comfort us. Soften our touch, lend our voices, clarify our minds, and fire up our hearts for the work at hand. O oh Lord, we ask for your guidance in action, word, and thought. Holy Mystery, you carry us when we are sorrowful, broken down in deepest grief, and unable to go further. Give us rest, give us a peace that is beyond our ability to find alone. We pay attention to words in the news of police reform, migrant worker, essential worker, health equity, social distancing, I can't breathe. Let us not forget words like hunger, poverty, deserted, overrun, and marginalized. In this time of fear and uncertainty, please hear our prayers. In this time of the pandemic, where we feel separated both physically and emotionally, let us handle your presence. Remind us also of the importance of loving and caring for our neighbors. In times of social distancing, enlighten us with new ways to pull our neighbors in and break with them our finest bread. Teach us new ways to wash our neighbors' feet when we are focused on washing our own hands. Most of all, Lord, we pray for strength. Give us the power to live in your plans for us. Teach us to see ourselves in the manner in which you see us. Remind us that we are created in your image, and there is no task too big for us to accomplish with your divine counsel. As we long for a return to normalcy, allow us to envision a new normal that better cares for your kingdom on earth and all your children who inhabit it. In your heavenly name, amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen.